The DC universe is broken. Superman is lost. Black Adam stayed in the red. Cyborg has been silenced. Wonder Woman has vanished into thin air. And the Flash has gotten into so much trouble that DC wishes he'd just run his way into an entirely new timeline. But there's still hope for the future, my friends. And the key to solving all of it? Cartoons. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that wants you to subscribe faster than The Flash. Bet you can't do it and write your favorite superhero down in the comments in less than three seconds. Three, two, Wait, you, you did it? Dang, you are faster than a speeding bullet. Well done. Now, it might be difficult to remember, but there was a time not too long ago when DC was the top dog when it came to superhero movies. Remember the Dark Knight trilogy? Those movies made over $2.4 billion at the box office. One of them was so good that when it wasn't nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars, the Academy literally changed their rules to avoid anything like that ever happening again. But, uh, in the following years, yeah. Yeah, not so much. The DCEU, which officially started with Man of Steel 10 years ago, has been an absolute mess. And that's not meant to be a judgment call or measure of quality. I mean, just as a point of fact, right now there are three different Batman and two separate Jokers running around at the same time. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Since the DCEU started, it's been a nightmare of hiring, firing, and rehiring multiple directors for the same project. Actors being let go, brought back again, only to be let go again. There's been public fallout over bad behavior by studio executives, constant cameos and teases for films that'll never happen, while completely finished movies are just outright cancelled. Meanwhile, you got star actors dealing with felony allegations popping up like the worst game of whack-a-mole ever. And the only thing that's dropped further than the quality of some of these things is WB's stock price, which got so low that it was basically sold for spare parts to the guy who runs the Discovery Channel. Gotta be honest here, loyal theorists, as someone who grew up loving DC's heroes more than Marvel's, it's been really heartbreaking to see this. But now, there's new hope. Warner Brothers has brought on James Gunn, writer and director of Guardians of the Galaxy, The Suicide Squad, and Peacemaker, to shepherd their movies back to financial and critical success. And while he certainly has a long path ahead of him to get the DC Universe back to where it needs to be, I think he can do it, provided he follows my advice today. That's right, loyal theorists! Today I plan to give this new Master of the Universe a five-point guide on how to make a successful DC cinematic franchise. And I'm not just pulling this from anywhere, I have proof that these steps will work. So put on your super suit! and kiss your Martha's goodbye. Let's save ourselves a franchise, shall we? Hey there, theorists! Future Matt Pat here for the second film theory in a row, go figure. So literally just a couple hours ago as I write this, James Gunn came out and did a big presentation talking about DC's future plans, announcing 10 new projects for gods and monsters, the so-called first chapter of their big DC reboots. And mind you, this is a couple days after we wrote and recorded this and got the audio out to our editors. James Gunn's announcement kind of came out of nowhere. Usually they preface this sort of stuff or try to time it around big industry events, but nope, this was him just dropping a big old promotional bomb in the middle of everyone. So what I'm gonna be doing now is laying out my advice exactly as it was written, not changing the script at all. But then, at the end of each section, I'm gonna pop back in to assess how Gunn seems to be handling things going forward. Does it look like he's taking our advice? Is he ignoring it and doing his own thing? Or is he falling into the mistakes of his predecessors? Let's just jump back into the theory and find out. Step number one, take care of your heavy hitters, both in terms of characters as well as the talent behind them. In pop culture, DC's characters have a pretty strong brand identity. Most people know who Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and the Flash are. Heck, even Green Lantern. So, at least to start, your focus needs to be on revitalizing most of the core cast with strong movies or series. It's not to say that I don't think a cyborg or a Black Adam or a Birds of Prey can work on screen, but why would people go to see those if you can't even get Superman right? Right now, DC needs to rebuild the audience's trust. They need to let them know that they're delivering fun, high-quality movies consistently with all the name brands that we know and love. Then, and only then, will people start to come out for the second stringers. I mean, case in point, just look at Marvel Phase 1. You gotta do your Captain America's and Thor's justice before anyone gives the talking tree and sassy rabbit a chance. The Marvel brand can carry smaller characters now. All that said, the other side of the coin is, after you've done a few of your core characters justice, if a creative comes along and has an amazing pitch for something more obscure, run with it. You may end up making C-list characters like Animal Man or the Doom Patrol into household names. And we know that DC is capable of this. Look no further than Shazam. It had a great story with a likable tone and a strong cast, and now you're seeing him enter the cultural zeitgeist more and more. Even more obscure? Before the Suicide Squad, no one had ever heard of a peacemaker, but now he's played by a world-famous wrestler and has his own popular TV show. My mom has heard of Peacemaker. Again, Marvel has routinely done this. When they didn't have the rights to their biggest names like Spider-Man or the X-Men, they looked at their second stringers. The core Avengers cast used to be the guys that cameoed in the Spider-Man cartoons. Now, they're all huge franchises 
franchises of their own right. And I don't just mean Iron Man and Captain America here either. They've turned the Scarlet Witch, Shang-Chi, Moon Knight, and the Guardians of the Galaxy into brands that are big enough to carry their own films, TV shows, and theme park rides. Kevin Feige's gone on record saying that when they're deciding which characters to adapt, it doesn't matter how famous or popular the character is in the comics. Only that there's great potential for a movie. Story should always come first. All right, future Map Hat with the assessment. So how's gun handling things? Well, it kind of remains to be seen. Though there was a big focus on projects like the new iterations of the core cast with Superman Legacy and The Brave and the Bold, there was also a surprisingly large amount of obscure stuff thrown in the mix. Swamp Thing? Booster Gold? Still, I think Gunn understands that they need to get their heavy hitters right. He told Deadline in one of the interviews, quote, One of our strategies is that we take our diamond characters, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and we use that to help prop up other characters that people don't know. And thus, we get ourselves creature commandos. So, in theory, in superhero theory, he seems to get it, but we'll see how things pan out. Which leads me to my next piece of advice. Number two, trust the source material. The fans love these characters, and they have loved these characters for decades. There's a reason for that, and it's your job to understand why. What is the core value of that character to the audience? And then once you understand what that is, do not change it. There are so many recent examples of people using IP without any sort of respect for the source material. Isn't that right, Velma? For instance, Superman, the symbol of truth, justice, and the American way, should not be destroying whole city blocks or snapping necks in a gritty drama. Or, if he is, that needs to be the point. That is the dramatic struggle. That's the conflict that the movie has to explore throughout its runtime. The character who's determined to be purely good is suddenly forced into positions where he has to question his own ethical line. That, that is an interesting movie. It's the superhero version of the trolley problem. Dig into that because it plays into what people love about Superman. His unironic, unspoiled sense of pure goodness and hope. Don't just leave it as some sort of footnote to happen at the end of the film. If you want an example of what not to do, take a look at Netflix's The Witcher. It started out great, with Henry Cavill, a beloved actor and fan of the material, stepping in to play the title character. But things quickly devolved as the creatives started changing parts of The Witcher mythos, to the point that rumors started swirling that the writers hated their source material. That right there is what we call a big red flag. And the fan reviews for both season two and the spin-off Blood Origins reflect that. Is it any wonder that Henry Cavill bowed out of the franchise that he loved so he could go work on a Warhammer adaptation? He even released a public statement saying, quote, I promise to respect this IP that we love. I promise to bring you something familiar. It's not a good look for the creative team over at The Witcher, huh? You have to choose the lesser evil. In short, audiences aren't dumb. They can tell when something's made with a genuine love for the IP. So if you find out that your writer staff can't be bothered to pick up and read some comic books, then just stop what you're doing. Stop it right there and find a project that they are excited about. Or, you know, scrap the whole team and get someone who actually wants the project. You know a character that has some ridiculous lore? Sonic the Hedgehog. But both Sonic movies have embraced that video game weirdness to deliver movies that are in the top 10 highest grossing for the year. They respected the source material. Speaking of that Sonic lore, by the way, if you're interested in just how crazy crazy Sonic lore gets and how the newest game's release breaks all of it, we just released a game theory about that very topic. Link is in the top right corner of the screen. Make sure you watch that one after we're done solving the DCEU's problems. Future Matt Pat back again, happy to say that I think Gunn nails this point. The new Superman project seems to be borrowing from more hopeful stories. The Brave and the Bold is bringing more of Batman's very popular family of characters onto the screen and embracing stranger parts of the obscure IP they're adapting, awesome. Even that Supergirl movie is adapting a really new, really weird story that fans and critics loved, borrowing more from stuff like John Carter than Smallville. On paper, everything here is looking great, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, we're talking about a guy who made a talking raccoon, alien tree, and polka dot man work on film. If there was any one of these five points that he was gonna knock out of the park, it was gonna be this one. Now back to the advice. Point number three, and this is a bit of a corollary to what we just talked about, if a character doesn't fit a tone, don't force him into a movie with that tone. Basically, you don't want to try to ram a Superman-shaped block through a Batman shaped hole. Despite both of them being superheroes, the types of stories they tell aren't anywhere close to the same. Something I don't think a lot of people understand about Marvel's output is that they aren't superhero movies. They're movies with superheroes in them, sure, and they do have consistent factors, but superhero isn't the genre. Instead, Marvel looks at their characters and then writes stories about them in genres that make sense. To really explain what I mean, let's just take a look at three of the franchises. Captain America, Ant-Man, and Spider-Man. All three of these series have Marvel's trademark quippy humor, costume design, art direction, 
insurrection, all that jazz, but the types of stories they're telling are all very different. Winter Soldier and Civil War are political thrillers making commentary on serious social issues. This isn't freedom, this is fear. There's worse ways to protect people. Protection, is that how you see this? She's Tony. not a US citizen and they oh, don't grant on, visas Tony. to weapons of mass destruction. She's a kid! Give me a break! Both Ant-Man films are heist movies, featuring Scott Lang breaking into somewhere highly secure to either steal something or rescue someone. My days of breaking into places and stealing really? are done. I want you to break into a place and steal some really? And both of these franchises are way different from the Spider-Man movies, which are all Gen Z John Hughes coming of age films. Who's Liz? Who's Liz? <laughs> She's <laughs> She's the best. She's awesome. She, yeah, she's just a girl who goes to my school. The stakes are different. The structures are different. The genres are different. So how does that apply to DC? Well, Batman's historically done this well. The Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy are crime thrillers. Matt Reeves' is The Batman leaned into the noir elements of a detective story. Both of them were dark and gritty, and rightfully so. But the problem begins when you start to layer that tone across a whole franchise. Wonder Woman? Shazam? Superman? They're not gritty characters. So trying to layer them into gritty stories is going to create tonal conflict. This was our arguably one of the biggest issues with the early phases of the DCEU. Zack Snyder's aesthetic was being applied like a filter over everything. The genre of those early movies was superhero comic book, and nothing really more. But if you look at the movies in the franchise that worked the best, Shazam, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and The Suicide Squad, they weren't afraid to break from the mold and carve out their own tone. Wonder Woman, the good one, was part period war film, part mythological epic. Aquaman borrowed a lot from old school adventure movies like Indiana Jones and the Mummy, and audiences loved both of them. Those. Ocean Man movie has drum playing octopus? Awesome. Kid superhero movie has YouTube humor? Perfect. Talking shark movie has giant alien starfish enemy? Cool. Just because everyone in the DCEU shares a collective world, it doesn't mean that everyone's part in that world needs to share the same tone. You need to look at the characters that you're working with and then make movies around them, not force them into the movies that you're trying to make. So make an upbeat Superman action film with a journalistic subplot. Make a space cop action drama with the Green Lantern. Just give them all room to breathe and do their own thing. Future MatPat review time. DC's approach to this one seems perfect. Not only are they letting stuff like the Batman and Joker sit in their own worlds with their own tone, they're also carrying over the only parts of the DCEU that people loved. Aquaman, Wonder Woman, Shazam, and the Suicide Squad. Plus, they are very clearly embracing different tones in the new adaptations that they're bringing to the table. They even had the same idea for that true detective in space version of Green Lantern that we just pitched right there. Great minds thinking alike, huh, James? Piece of advice number four. And this is a big one. Take your time. Take your time making the movies good, duh, but also, more importantly, take your time announcing what you're working on. That way you can see what works, what audiences react positively to, and what you need to work on behind the scenes if something doesn't pan out. All without publicly embarrassing everyone involved. Seems obvious, right? You would think, but a lot of studios make this mistake. See, the MCU had this weird marketing strategy for a film franchise when it was still young. They'd have Kevin Feige come out at Comic-Con and announce the entire next three to five years of movies all at once. At the time, when they were still growing their brand, it worked really well for them. It got fans excited, which built up hype. But this taught the other studios the wrong lessons. Everyone wanted a piece of the pie, and so they tried their best to start the next MCU ASAP. Universal might just be the best worst example of this that I can think of, with their attempted reboot of their classic monster movies under the Dark Universe banner back in the mid-2010s. They announced half a dozen movies mapped out with a deep mythology's worth of lore. They cast Hollywood superstars like Tom Cruise, Johnny Depp, Angelina Jolie. They even released a star-studded cast photo of the major players all in one place, so you knew that they were serious about it. Fun fact, by the way, none of those actors were actually in the same room for this photo shoot. They were just photoshopped together. Anyway, the one thing that Universal didn't do in all this? Make sure the movies that launched the franchise were actually worth watching. Dracula Untold was a moderate financial success, but was eviscerated by critics and fans. And The Mummy, starring Tom Cruise? It did even worse. The most memorable thing about that movie was the trailer they mistakenly uploaded without any audio. What the hell? Ugh! <sighs> <sighs> Yep, that was a real trailer uploaded by a real major movie studio. All in all, even with the exciting IP and awesome star power they had lined up, Universal did not take their time building up this IP. And as a result, people looked at the Dark Universe and said, I'm not interested in that at all. <laughs> DC did the exact same thing. In 2014, they announced 10 movies for their new universe spearheaded by Zack Snyder, ranging from Wonder Woman and Aquaman to Shazam and Cyborg. Some were as far away as six years. The only problem with this? They didn't actually wait to see how people liked the first couple movies. Cue the internal executive scramble, studio interference, replacing directors, shifting schedules, delays, cancellations, and public embarrassment. All of them were self-inflicted wounds that were totally avoidable. Warner Brothers didn't need to go out and announce 10 movies. They could have just gone with three or four, seen how people
people liked the first stab at things and then privately changed plans in the background when it became clear that audiences weren't clicking with the DCEU. This is the one that makes future map pad a little worried. I'm skeptical about the fact that so many projects just got announced this week. Another 10 in total, which is just like that initial wave of DCEU announcements. That being said, I suppose they're not completely starting from scratch here. They are bringing what worked from the DCEU over into this new universe, so at least they're starting on a positive note. Plus, I also found this quote where Gunn said that they're willing to delay movies if the scripts aren't 100% ready. Now, I would hope that this would normally be the default in Hollywood, but looking at blockbusters over the last decade, uh, clearly not. But I wouldn't be getting too far ahead of myself because piece of advice number five, don't have a long-term plan. I'm not kidding, don't meticulously plan out the new universe so you know exactly what's supposed to happen and when. I know it sounds counterproductive, but I promise that you'll regret doing this. By having so much of your franchise laid out, you don't give yourself room to maneuver if something changes. If a new character pops up that you want to insert into the franchise, or a writer comes along to offer you a great story that otherwise doesn't fit. Again, you can learn from Marvel here. And the big example I'm going to point to is Captain America Civil War. This was a huge movie for the franchise, basically Avengers 2.5, featuring the culmination of a ton of stories and setting up a ton of others for the future. From the outside looking in, it might have seemed like they planned the whole thing from the start, but they didn't. Civil War wasn't even the original pitch. The writers wanted to adapt a different Captain America story called Mad Bomb, but Feige didn't think that it went big enough, so things pivoted to Civil War. And even then, there were multiple versions of Civil War floating around with and without Spider-Man, since Marvel was busy negotiating over the character with Sony. And if they hadn't come to an agreement there, Ant-Man would have switched sides to become Team Iron Man, thereby changing his entire character arc in all the future movies. But Marvel just decided to go with the flow and did what worked in the moment. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't have a vague idea of what to do or where your story is going. You 100% should so you can build to it. Marvel did exactly that in Hulk and Iron Man 1, teasing the Avengers initiative because they knew that eventually they were going to have a crossover. They just didn't have what was going to happen in the Avengers laid out. And then the Avengers movie itself teased Thanos because again, Marvel knew that eventually they'd want him to be a big bad. But writing out how exactly they were going to get there beat for beat, that's no bueno. Seriously, did you know that for a while nobody at Marvel had decided where the Infinity Stones were? Or even what was and wasn't an Infinity Stone? True story, according to tweets from James Gunn himself, when they first shot Guardians of the Galaxy, the Infinity Stone in the movie was red, the color of the Reality Stone. But in post, it had to be changed to the Purple Power Stone because Marvel had decided after the fact that the red one would be coming from Thor the Dark World's ether. Heck, they didn't even know why Thanos wanted the stones to kill half the universe until they sat down to write the script for Infinity War. I mean, if you need any more proof of their lack of a plan, they featured the Infinity Gauntlet in Odin's vault as early as Phase 1. But plans changed. Egg and it was retconned. Which, when you think about it, is kind of funny because this, then, is a fake of a gauntlet that hadn't even been built yet. I made what he wanted, a device capable of harnessing the power of the stones. But you know what? I don't hate it because we got a better movie franchise out of it. Final future map hat review. I'm not too worried there. Even though they did talk about plans to have characters appear in multiple projects, Gunn didn't come out and announce a giant crossover event that everything's leading up to. It seems like they're just gonna go with the flow for now, which I think is the smart option. That said, there is still one final big thing that I want to point out to Gunn here. So, that is a lot of advice, but here's the biggest twist of them all. DC already has the perfect blueprint to model parts of this new cinematic universe from, and it's followed basically all of this advice. It was called the DC Animated Universe. If you grew up with DC in the 90s and aughts, you'd definitely recognize this franchise. It's where a lot of the iconic modern portrayals of DC's characters originated. Kevin Conroy's Batman, Mark Hamill's Joker, those were these versions of Batman and Joker before they made their way into the animated films and Arkham video games. So how does the DC AU follow my advice? Let's go point by point. Firstly, yes, they knew that the heavy hitters were important. They started this universe out with Batman, and then they grew into a Superman show before they had the two of them team up in Justice League. But what else did they do? Well, an awesome new character named Static came along in the comics, and they jumped at the chance to adapt him with a creative team that were excited to tell his stories. And when the really weird but really cool idea for a cyberpunk Batman spinoff came along, they made Batman Beyond. They also let less important characters shine in the Justice League shows. Seriously, Hawkgirl? The Question? Etrigan the Demon? All minor characters that had leading roles episodes, even entire story arcs devoted to them. Not only that, but they adapted these characters in ways that didn't pigeonhole them into tones that didn't fit. They let Batman have a darker, more noir tone. Superman was more upbeat and sci-fi. Static Shock didn't feel the same as Batman Beyond, which also didn't feel the same as Justice League. Fourthly, they took their time building the world. Batman the Animated Series was first released in 1993. Superman didn't get his spin-off until 1996, and Justice League didn't come along until 2001. And finally, though DCAU had Honcho Bruce Tim 
and might have had ideas on where to take the universe's story, the creators didn't plan beyond what seasons and shows had already been greenlit. They didn't go into Batman in the early 90s mapping out where their Justice League spinoff in 2005 was gonna take them. Listen, DC, James, you guys have a golden opportunity here to take some of the most beloved characters and IP in the world and make something really meaningful. It won't be easy, but exactly how to do it is right in front of you. All you need to do is follow my advice and just go watch some great old cartoons. In the meantime, though, if you want to see my last piece of advice that I gave to DC that they chose not to follow, check out my theory on how they should have used the Snyder Cut to fix the DCEU timeline. Or if you want to see what Batman villain DC should have set up with the Batman, check out my theory about Hush and the Joker. Don't forget to subscribe for more superhero theories coming your way soon. And as always, remember, it's all just a theory. A film theory! And cut!